you know, we've got a special guest here for you. And I'm so excited. What a great bio. I'm going to read it. It's so impressive. I've got to read it to you. <clears throat> Our guest was selected by NASA in 1998. He's a retired Army colonel and has accumulated more than 178 days in space. This astronaut flew aboard the space shuttle Discovery on mission STS-120 back in 2007. In 2010, this astronaut launched aboard a Russian Soyuz spacecraft to the International Space Station, where he served as flight engineer for Expedition Number 24 and the commander of Expedition 25. Now, during that mission, this astronaut conducted not one, but three unplanned spacewalks to replace a faulty ammonia pump module. Altogether, this astronaut has conducted six spacewalks, totaling 43 hours and 30 minutes. He's currently working on NASA's human landing system as part of NASA's Artemis program that will send the first woman and the next man to the moon in 2024. The New York native holds a Bachelor of Science in Applied Science and Engineering from the United States Military Academy at West Point and a Master of Science in Aerospace Engineering from the Georgia Tech Institute in Atlanta, Georgia. This retired colonel is a dual rated master army aviator and has logged more than 70,000, I'm sorry, 7,000 hours and 46 different rotary and fixed wing aircraft and spacecraft. It is with great pleasure that we present for each and every one of you, astronaut Doug Wheelock. Colonel Wheelock, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, John Dar. It's great to be with everyone and great to be back at the Great Lakes Science Center. Thank you. You're one of our favorite astronauts. And as a veteran astronaut, I'm sure that you have so much that you can share. Tell us about your time aboard the International Space Station. Well, it was quite a journey. I actually got the chance to spend uh, uh, my first mission into space was on the Space Shuttle Discovery uh, back in 2007. Um, it was planned to be about a 13, 12 to 13 day mission. Uh, and it turned out to be a, about a 15 day mission because we had a major malfunction up there on one of my spacewalks, um, which made it very exciting. But I went up and back on the Space Shuttle Discovery uh, to the space station. As, as we approached uh, the International Space Station, which was a lot smaller back then in 2007, um, I saw, we saw it first as like a little bright star as we are approaching it. And then as we, as we got closer and closer, of course, during our rendezvous and docking phase, uh, it began to fill up my uh, my sight radical, and I thought like, wow, it looks like a castle in the sky. And um, it was so amazing. It was almost seemed surreal, you know, that we uh, that we had uh, traveled all this all this distance and uh, and it, it, at these great speeds and closing to be able to to be able to replicate the motion of the uh, of the of the station traveling at seventeen thousand five hundred miles per hour, which is five miles per second, and be able to dock just like just smooth as silk, you know, uh, matching our speeds and our rotations and things like that. So it was qu quite amazing, uh, that first mission. And then um, I was there, for, I got a chance to do three spacewalks on that mission. And part of that was assembling the space station. Um, and we, we were building out the space station. And then I went back three years later in 2010 on a Russian Soyuz rocket and spent uh, six months on board the space. Uh, space station, which was much different than my earlier uh, shuttle mission on the space shuttle. And so going up and back on a Soyuz rocket and coming back in, uh, burning through the atmosphere in that little Soyuz capsule was also uh, quite a dramatic part of the uh, part of that mission as well. So um, th this is an incredible um, orbiting platform that we have uh, in, in Earth orbit, we, we do we have four laboratories on board the space station. We're doing right now. We're doing somewhere between 200 and 250 science experiments on the uh, in our laboratories on board the space station, and uh, we've had now uh, 20 years. We just celebrated 20 years of continuous human presence, and so it's a it's a quite an amazing place to visit and even more amazing place to live and work as well, so. It's just, it's, it's amazing. Now, you did mention that you returned back to Earth in a Soyuz spacecraft, and, and I have to ask you, what was it like 
launching in the Soyuz, and how did that compare with launching aboard the uh, aboard the space shuttle? Uh, completely different. You know, the the um, launching on the space shuttle. Of course, we had the. If you remember, we have that external tank that um, where the liquid fuel is on the space shuttle, and then we had two white candlesticks on the uh, on the outside, which is our solid rocket boosters. And then we put that shuttle on the outside. So in the roll axis, if you think about it, the roll axis, it was about this external tank. So when you're inside of the spaceship, the space shuttle, and you roll, it feels like you're on the end of a merry-go-round sort of being spun around, you know. Um, or I, I, I remember as a young kid growing up in upstate New York, we used to skate on the pond, you know, and we used to spin each other uh, on ice skates. We'd, we'd, uh, we'd fling each other around on the, on, the, uh, on the pond on ice skates as well. It was kind of like that riding on the space shuttle. And, um, and during launch on the space shuttle, it was pretty violent. There's a lot of vibration, um, a, lot of, a lot of noise. And, um, and then coming back home, on the space shuttle was very, very smooth. And we just sort of, we landed as a glider on the runway down in uh, Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Um, and as we feel a little bit of a buffet coming back in through the atmosphere, opposite on the Soyuz. So on the Soyuz, you sit on top of this big, tall candlestick. And so uh, you don't have that moment arm, so you don't feel, have that merry-go-round feeling. And um, you could feel the thrust coming up through, through your back as you're laying on your back in the rocket and as the as the engine stage uh one we you know the engines uh, uh the engines uh stop working and then we kick off that stage then the next stage lights and we go so you do feel a lot of vibration sort of in and out of your seat we call it pogo vibration and um so that was that was a little bit dramatic a little bit of drama on the on the ascent but very smooth as compared to the shuttle now coming back home through the atmosphere completely opposite. We, I, uh, I kid that uh, coming back and uh, through the atmosphere in the Soyuz capsule is kind of like going over Niagara Falls in a barrel, only the barrel's on fire. And so it, it's, uh, it's quite a ride back home. So it's completely different uh, uh, transport both to space and back to Earth. So Incredible. Now, your second trip to the International Space Station was different from your first trip. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, so, yeah, the, my first trip was on the Space Shuttle Discovery. It was a 15-day mission, and um, it was kind of like a sprint for 15 days. And our, our mission was to go there and assemble these parts of the space station. To, we were essentially part of the construction crew uh, building the space station. And uh, my second mission was six months. And so uh, quite a bit different uh, way you approach a, a long-duration mission. Um, we approach it much differently with a, you know, we talk about um, um, astronaut training and astronaut health. We we think of it as heart, mind, body, and soul. So you, so you uh, you have to look after your physical health. You have to look after the health of your um, uh, your mental health with uh, with staying engaged intellectually with things that are going on. Your emotional health, which is our connection to each other and um, and to uh, other parts of our both parts of our crew and our friends and family on the planet. And then of course, the uh, I call it the purpose-driven part of it, or the soul, heart, mind, body, and soul. Uh, what's driving you? What's your purpose uh, for your work and things like that, which we all are facing actually those those four things in this pandemic we're going through. You know, it's it's kind of a realization that we, we all have to stay in order to not only survive in space or in a pandemic when you're in a lockdown, um, not only survive, but you, there are ways you can thrive when you look after your health in each of those four areas. And so um, the heart, mind, body, and soul, they're kind of like the corner pieces of a jigsaw puzzle you're trying to piece together, right? So so that second mission, the long duration mission, it was so vitally important to, um, and I, I approached that miss, mission since I knew I was gonna be away from our planet and away from my friends and family and everything I ever knew for a long duration period, uh, that it was it was really up to me to stay healthy in each of those four areas. And you really have to work at it, uh, pretty much like we're experiencing uh, this past year with this uh, with dealing with the isolation and separation from family and friends that we're all experiencing with this pandemic. So astronaut training is very similar to the training we've all been going through. 
uh, this year with the pandemic. So it's it's pretty amazing the way that we approach it. So it's a unique approach, and it sounds like you have a lot of great advice for us right here uh, as uh, as we try to ease through this pandemic. Now I know that uh, during that second mission there were several unplanned EVAs, uh, unplanned spacewalks. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Sure. Um, it was actually, I remember the date and time. It was a Saturday night and we operate on the space station and Greenwich Mean Time. So we normalize because we're orbiting the earth once every 90 minutes, we get a sunrise and a sunset um, every 45 minutes. So if you look out the window, uh, you can't tell what time of day it is. And so we're orbiting uh, orbiting once every 90 minutes in the Earth. And so uh, so we get 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets every day um, on the space station. And so we, we normalize our time to Greenwich Mean Time. And uh, we had a major malfunction that crippled the space station. It was July 31st, 2010. It was a Saturday evening, about 11.30 uh, p.m. GMT. Uh, when we had an ammonia pump that runs our cooling on the outside of the space station, it actually seized up and broke and, uh, and, and, uh, and shut down our cooling system, which shut down half of our cooling system and shut, uh, shut down half of our experiments, uh, half of our lighting, um, half of our life support systems like the oxygen we're breathing. And uh, we sort of had a joke. We had a crew of six on board. Um, and say, okay, you three hold your breath, us three are going to breathe, and then we'll hold our breath and you breathe. We sort of joked around about that, but it was really, it was really quite that critical because half of our system shut down, and it took us, it took us 16 days and three emergency spacewalks or unplanned spacewalks to be able to figure out what happened. Uh, did we have a spare uh, pump, and how are we going to go outside? pull that old pump out, put this new pump in and then fire it back up, you know? And of course you have all these connections and everything. So um, it took three spacewalks in 16 days to do that. And it was, it really changed my life actually though. It, it changed everything I ever knew about the importance of teamwork. You know, I mean, all of it was right there in front of me. The importance of, uh, of being able to stay in the moment, which is difficult for us as humans because we, we tend to, you know, we have regrets about the past and we worry about the future when we we really only can control what's here and now, right? I mean, we hope for the future and we and we can plan for the future and we can learn from our mistakes in the past. We certainly can't change the past. The only thing that we can exercise change on is the here and now, the present. And so it's so vitally important. It's, it's actually important um, in any walk of life um, wherever you are in the continuum of uh, being a student or maybe being uh, being a parent or what have you, you know, uh, being able to stay in the moment and, and treasure the moment um, and change what you can uh, to plan for a, uh, for a future outcome, you know, and all that was like, uh, was right there large and in charge in front of my eyes on the space station. And it was really a point where we, we could choose to survive um, or to abandon the station was another option and, and uh, leave this crippled station and come back to Earth. Uh, but we decided to stay and fight through it. And it took us 16 days, but I learned a tremendous amount about, uh, about teamwork, about perseverance, um, about um, uh, you know, just, just sort of figuring out a way to overcome in what, what sometimes seems like insurmountable odds. So um, it was quite a life experience for me. That's just amazing. In fact, it's it's fascinating. I, I could talk to you about this for hours, but but I've got some student questions here that I want to share with you and and get your answers. So um, let's see. I've got James. James wants to know uh, what do you eat aboard the ISS, and what was the worst food that you ever had in space? That's a great question, James. Uh, um, and um, most of the food that we eat on board the space station is either dehydrated. So we just add water to it. It's in a plastic uh, dehydrated pack and it's got a little septum on the outside of it. So we just inject either hot or cold water into it and just rehydrate it. Some of the, some of the food we have is, um, uh, is the thermal stabilized food you get in the, the military MREs, the meals ready to eat. Um, 
you could find those at uh, any camping store or supply store like uh, that you would take for camping on, on hiking missions and stuff like that. So uh, those type of foods, we would occasionally, when we have a resupply uh, ship that would come up with new with food for us, they, which only comes like every quarter or so. So every two to three months, you get a resupply ship that would come up. But they would throw a bag of fresh fruit in there, which was really wonderful uh, for us to enjoy. Um, but most of the food was uh, this thermal stabilized food or dehydrated food. Wasn't enormously tasty. Um, so, so eating and food for me on uh, while I was on the during that six month on the space station just became a way to refuel for me. I I, I like really wonderful tasting foods, and but my sense of taste and my sense of smell were really dulled in space. And when I thought about it, I talked to the our nutritionist when I got back to Earth, and we, we don't really consider as everything's floating in space, and so most of our taste buds um, are on our tongue, of course. And so while we're eating our food, you know, gravity's holding it on your tongue. So you get the full flavor here on Earth. Uh, but in space, everything is floating. So while you're chewing your food, you know, most of it's floating in your mouth. So the only taste you're getting is out of what's make, coming in contact with your tongue, which is not all of the food at one time. So, um, so the sense of taste really kind of is dulled a little bit and things aren't quite as tasty as they... Um, uh, as they seem on Earth, you know, and um, so we take a lot of uh, on board the space station. We have a lot of like liquid condiments, like liquid pepper. We have some uh, hot sauce and uh, some uh, vinegars and oils and things like that to kind of give a little added flavor to our foods. And so some people will put a little dab of that on uh, before they start eating. So, and I would have to say, I think uh, James, you asked about the worst food. Um, in that meal ready to eat, I don't know if they still have this. Uh, I was on the station back 10 years ago. So, uh, but we had this, um, it was called uh, beef teriyaki. And um, in the packet, it feels like a big beef steak, you know. So I'm thinking like, I was so hungry for, you know, a piece of, uh, you know, a piece of the steak. And so when I ate it, um, it was more like the texture was more like a paste. And so I was ready to kind of sink my teeth into like something that felt like a steak, you know, and uh, or a hamburger or something, you know, a beef patty. And um, it was more like uh, beef flavored uh, toothpaste or something like that. So, so that was probably the, the my least, uh, my least enjoyable uh, meal on the space station was the uh, MRE, the, the beef teriyaki. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. Here's another question for you. This one comes from one of our visitors. Her name is Karen. And Karen wants to know if Pluto is a planet. Uh, well, technically, I guess Pluto is not a planet, but I believe it should still be a planet. Raise your hands. I can't see you, but raise your hands if you think Pluto should still be a planet. Um, yeah, I, when I was a when I was a little boy, of course, we even with our most powerful telescopes from Earth, Pluto was still just a a really faint, fuzzy point of light out in the in the distant uh, solar system you know so but i just loved um, the idea of pluto being out there so far so far from home you know for, so far from us uh, here on our home um that pluto became my favorite planet and um and uh i think and now, you know five years ago in 2015 we had the nasa new horizons uh mission that did a flyby of pluto and we have some really, really cool images uh, that were sent back from that spaceship. So you can go online and look at the um, NASA New Horizons mission to Pluto. Um, just uh, type that into your web search and, uh, and uh, there's incredible images of Pluto uh, when we did our flyby. And so when I saw those images, especially the one that looks like it's got a heart on it, it's a feature on the, on the surface of Pluto. And uh, when you see that, it's like, I think Pluto should be a planet again. So anyway, but um, I think uh, Pluto has been demoted to uh, uh, to a, either. I, I'm, I'm not sure what the uh, what the official name of the uh, of the of that uh, celestial body is now. But um, I think it, Pluto's got my vote anyway. So <laughs> that's cool. Pluto is a minor planet as it's classified. Minor, minor planet. 
I but I noted your vote that it be a return to planet size <laughs> status. Here's another question from you. This one is from Scotty V. And Scotty wants to know if you can make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in space, or does the jelly just float everywhere? Hey, Scotty, that's a great question. Uh, actually, the, we didn't have problems with the jelly or the peanut butter, and they usually came in little packets, just squeeze packets, and so you'd kind of tear off, much like when you go to like a through like a drive through or something of a fast food place, you get a little packet of ketchup or a packet of uh, mustard or something like that. Our peanut butter and our jelly came in little packets like that, so you just kind of tear off the corner and you can squeeze it. Now, where we had problems with was bread. You can't take bread to space because there's so many crumbs that um, that if you were to take a loaf of bread and pull out a piece of bread, all these crumbs would just go all over the place. They'd clog our filters. You'd breathe them in, uh, which would be horrible to get breathe into your lungs. they get in your eyes. And so, so we use uh, what we use for bread on the space station are flour tortillas. And so we have packets and packets of flour tortillas. And we take those flour tortillas and we spread on out of those uh, packets, we spread on our peanut butter and our jelly, and you can roll it up like a like a taco almost, or you can put uh, two pieces of, uh, you know, between two pieces of um, a flour tortilla and make yourself a sandwich that way. So uh, a lot less crumbs uh, and, a, and a lot easier to kind of keep confined, so. Wow, I would have I would have never guessed that. And uh, do you still eat your peanut butter and jelly on uh, on taco shells now that you're um, back? I, I don't anymore. But you know what? That's a great idea. Maybe uh, maybe I should do that one day just to bring you know to, to celebrate the 20 years on the space station. So. I love it. I love it. Uh, here's another question from you, and this one is from Heather. That that's Scotty's mom, and uh, Heather wants to know how do astronauts connect with their families while they're in space? How do they maintain some level of normalcy? Yeah, great question, Heather, because uh, it's so vitally important, um, especially on a long duration mission, uh, because the, uh, the feelings of isolation, the feelings of separation, you know how we felt as uh, being separated from our family members and extended family and friends. And and some, of, some people that may be alone or they have uh, they're living alone or something. They have also have feelings of isolation and, and things, which are normal human human uh, uh, feelings when you when we're when you feel like you when you begin to feel like you're alone. And so um, the uh, so on board the space station, we actually have uh, several different methods to stay connected with friends and family. And it's so vitally important to your to your mental health, to your emotional health, to stay connected to your uh, to your to your planet, or essentially, so you can look out the windows, which you've probably seen the beautiful images of the Earth um, uh, from space, and you, it just looks like this floating ball in this vast empty sea of darkness, like an explosion of color in day in the daylight hours, and um, and it's just a beautiful place. But you, um, within just a few days or a few weeks, you begin to feel like, gosh, that's everything I've ever known is down there, and I'm not there, and so those feelings of separation begin to set in. So we have an, uh, an IP phone on board where we can phone any place on the planet we can call from the space station. And, um, and so we, we do that a lot. We also have video uh, conferences with our family and friends. Uh, so those, usually we would do those, when I was on board, we did those once a week. We'd set up family conferences so you can at least see, much like what we're doing here, a video a video and audio conference um, with our family members, which was great as well. I, I love to use, we have a ham radio on board the space station. And I, I'd never really used a ham radio, but I got my license before I went to the space station and, um, and made just thousands of contacts around the world, you know, all over this, uh, all over this planet, wherever there's a ham radio operator, uh, I probably talked to them, you know, from the station. So it, it was a good way to, to stay connected to the planet. So, well, listen, Doug, we're getting uh, we're getting close to the end of our show, and I have one more question for you. We know that you're involved in some pretty amazing things, getting ready for the Artemis project. Can you tell us what the future is like at NASA, and how that future is going to benefit people right back here on Earth? Oh, it's so it's so exciting what we're doing. Probably even even right now, where there's been this sort of renaissance in the our commercial and industrial base across this nation 
uh, actually globally as well, but across our nation, there's so much interest now. And we're trying to uh, make connections with our smallest kids in, the, in our elementary schools and our kindergartens, all the way up through graduate level schooling to get them involved in this, uh, in this renaissance of technology and exploration. And so it's a very, very exciting future. Um, I, w I wish and I, I still hope that I hold outside hope that I could go to, to the moon maybe, um, but we certainly will be sending, um, uh, we have a mission right now, boots on the moon in 2024. So in only four years, um, uh, we intend to put the first woman and the next man to step foot on the moon. And so we're very, very excited about that. Uh, and even more so, uh, we intend to take this, uh, the studies that we do um, on the moon and in lunar orbit um, and extend those onto Mars in probably 10, 15, 20 years, regardless of how long it takes us to get to Mars. Um, what's very exciting for us at NASA, most of our astronauts are selected in like their mid thirties. And so, um, so that means if we, if we intend to put people on Mars within 15 years or 20 years, that those first people to step foot on Mars are somewhere in our classrooms, you know. Uh, they're somewhere in our, either from kindergarten all the way up through our universities at graduate school, that those first people that one day will be celebrating stepping foot, the first people to step foot on Mars um, are somewhere in our classrooms. And that's very exciting for us um, to know. And every time I go to visit students, whether it's online here or actually in the classroom uh, or in auditoriums, I, I look out into the crowd and I'm wondering, I, I wonder if that first person to step foot on Mars is somewhere in this room, you know? And that's very exciting for us at NASA. Doug, I can tell you, there are quite a few young people that are here at the Science Center today. Many of them, just like my granddaughter, they wanna be an astronaut just like you. They wanna to go to the moon. Do you have any words of encouragement for them? Sure, yeah, because I, I'm just an ordinary little boy from an ordinary place. I grew up in a very small town um, and I learned some life lessons actually from, from Neil Armstrong. I remember when I, when I was a little boy when we, when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon on Apollo 11, and I was in elementary school, and I went to class that next uh, couple months after that. That was in July, of course. And uh, in September, I started school, and I had a brand new teacher, and um, and her name was Christine West. And she, I was in a little country town in this very small town, very small school. And she came in, and she said, hey, who saw the moon landing? And I raised my hand. You know, She said, one day you could do that too. And I thought like, this lady's crazy. She has no idea where she is in this tiny little school with just ordinary kids. Well, years later, as I went through my career and I was, I had been selected as an astronaut, I got a chance to meet Neil Armstrong for the first time. And um, I had a chance to spend maybe a dozen times where I got a chance to spend time with Neil Armstrong. But the first time I met him, um, I started to remember back to Miss West, you know, my, my teacher in elementary school. And I, I kept thinking, I wonder if she was right, you know, about, um, about ordinary people being able to do things like this as well. And so I asked him, I, it came my turn to ask a question. I said, Mr. Armstrong, when you were on the moon, did you have a moment where you can think back, think about what a profound moment it was in human history? And, um, and he said, you know, I did. I thought about my family. I, I put my thumb up and covered up all of what I could see of the earth. I thought about my family and friends. I thought about the engineers that built that rocket. But most of all, I thought to myself, how does an ordinary little boy from Wapakoneta, Ohio, end up standing on the moon, you know? And I thought like, hey, wait a second, that's a familiar story because that's my story as well. We're all just ordinary kids from ordinary places. And so the, the advice that I give, um, you know, we're ordinary kids from ordinary places, just like you are as well. Uh, I'm the same way, uh, but we have these extraordinary dreams for our life and the things we want to achieve and the places we want to go and the things we want to explore. And so the advice that I give to kids of all ages is to find something that you love to do. First of all, start with a curious mind. Be curious about the world around you. Uh, when you see something happening or something operating or something, uh, you know, whether it's an injustice or what have you, just be curious about the world around you, what's going on, and then find something you love 
Uh, and when you find something you love to do, um, it, it will eventually become your, your passion and your profession as you, as you move along. And then, and then live your life with so much passion that people can't take their eyes off of you. And that's the, that should be the goal for all of us, regardless of the profession we're in, whether you're an astronaut or a, or a firefighter or a teacher. Um, it really doesn't matter if you're living your life to your full potential and with, with all of your passion that uh, you'll get to the point at the top of your game where people will not be able to take their eyes off of you. And that should be the goal for all of our children and, and ourselves as well as we, uh, as we uh, uh, seek to achieve uh, greatness in our, in our chosen uh, walk of life. Colonel Wheelock, thank you so much for joining us here at the Great Lakes Science Center on this great weekend where we're celebrating 20 years of human presence on the International Space Station. Thank you so much. We promise to stay curious. Thank you.